All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the cloud and infrastructure track. Uh, go ahead and kick things off. I hope everyone's having a good day. And I'd like to start off, of course, by saying I hope you are all doing well and that you and your families have managed to stay safe and healthy during these extraordinary days. My name is Adam Azoff. I'm the director of US government customer success at Huddle, an industry uh, leader in secure cloud-based file collaboration. Uh, we're a proud ATARC industry partner, and it's a personal honor today to be able to give some opening remarks here to kick off the cloud track. So um, the global COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to reinvent how we conduct business, how we educate and learn, how we socialize, engage, and collaborate with one another. Cloud computing has undeniably played a critical role, enabling governments and contractors to quickly apply solutions in response to the crisis and maintain mission continuity. Cybercrime, however, doesn't like social distancing. And sadly, during times of disruption, and as remote working is on the rise, individuals may, and I should even say have, become more prone to cybercrime, such as phishing attempts. So while the movement toward the cloud, of course, um, was already underway for years, there's uh, no doubt that this pandemic has served as a catalyst of sort, pushing organizations towards expedited cloud adoption, uh, alongside new rules and regulations and policymaking. Um, at Huddle, our clients across the board have reported increased adoption, not only of our um, system, but of other solutions, uh, complementary applications like Microsoft Teams and, and DocuSign. The new environment uh, we live in has been forcing important questions about how governments can adjust their regulatory environments to best enable cloud computing while not compromising the productivity, security, or health of their employees. And because a similar crisis is certainly possible, um, perhaps even to be expected in the future, policymakers and regulators are turning their attention to future proofing, creating the right infrastructure and quickly to quickly deploy and adopt necessary cloud solutions to address these new challenges. Challenges we couldn't have even imagined six months ago, right? So some of the um, you know, speakers to follow and in the panel discussion will surely address on some of these challenges, you know, how do how do government agencies um, move forward with the reality of a widely distributed workforce, right? Uh, what new security challenges are posed by uh, the increased adoption of information communications technologies? Uh, perhaps one positive outcome, however, of the crisis is we've seen an increased willingness in uh, working together. More forums exist for federal agencies to share cybersecurity information, more collaborative multi-agency, fed state, public private uh, partnerships are springing up across the US. Um, and let's not, let's not forget greater involvement in existing working groups such as ATARC to share information on emerging trends and best practices. Um, for our clients, Huddle continues to play a critical role in addressing these challenges specifically in the realm of file sharing between government employees and their external stakeholders. Yet despite the growing trend towards mobile working and cross-organizational collaboration, many public and private organizations still lack a secure yet usable and reliable way of facilitating such external multi-agency engagements. So for content that needs to be shared outside the firewall, but only with proper security controls in place, Huddle provides a FedRAMP authorized solution at the moderate impact level, which includes comprehensive file protection, an easy to use workspace model, full audit trails, activity feeds, and on-demand reporting, automatic and unlimited version controls, as well as a built-in comparison functionality, file and folder locking, as well as uh, team-based permissions, and uh, native two-factor authentication, uh, we offer simple single sign-on uh, integration and, and we're MDM compatible as well. 
Uh, we have built-in workflow and automatic notifications, as well as native integrations with other tools, such as those available in Office 365. Um, I should also say that we offer a unique uh, workspace model. I'll be at our virtual booth um, giving demos, or you can sign up for a demo if you'd like to learn more. And um, just about out of time, but again, if you come by our, our booth, I'd love to take a moment to walk you through some case studies of how um, Huddle has basically um, provided efficiency gains and a secure way of collaborating across agencies um, here we have a case study at the FAA that I'd be happy to um, share with you regarding NISC, which is a $1.2 billion program that we help maintain uh, contract continuity and avoid any lapse through this crisis. Um, so that's all for me. I hope everyone um, enjoys the rest of the program today and thank you so much for your time. Morning. Can uh, everyone hear me? See me okay? Uh, if the uh, engineer could just drop in chat and let me know. It looks like I'm live, but I'm not seeing myself. Okay. Um, just going to go ahead and get started and assume everything is okay. Somebody can yell in chat if you uh, can't hear me or see me for any reason. Um, good morning, my name is Bill Hunt. Uh, I'm the Chief Enterprise Architect over at the US Small Business Administration. Um, and uh, I'm also on the ATARC board and uh, serve as the government co-chair uh, for the Cloud Working Group here at ATARC as well. So just wanted to uh, take an opportunity to chat with everybody this morning. Um, I spent the last seven months or so as the acting IT director also over at uh, the US Small Business Administration. Um, so as you all can probably imagine, uh, we've been a little bit busy. Uh, there's some things going on in the world right now uh, that have been keeping us pretty occupied uh, trying to uh, support uh, small businesses across the country. Um, so that end, I think a lot of people are just learning for the first time that uh, the U.S. Small Business Administration, in addition to certifying small businesses and giving advice to small businesses, um, is also a bank. Um, we give out loans uh, to businesses. Um, and in addition to general purpose loans, we do uh, disaster assistance. Um, so basically right after FEMA would be deployed to a disaster zone, we tend to show up a day or two later and we give out small business loans to get businesses back on their feet. Um, obviously during COVID-19, um, this has been a unique series of challenges for us uh, in that Congress has asked us to give out billions of dollars um, very, very rapidly, very quick turnaround. Um, and so today I'm going to talk for a few minutes uh, about how cloud uh, has enabled some of this journey. Um, if any of you heard me speak before, it was probably in my previous role uh, at OMB, where I was the cloud policy lead. Um, but I actually spent 20 years in the private sector building software, um, uh, doing DevOps, DevSecOps. Um, so the things I'm going to talk about today, uh, thankfully for any of you who have heard me speak before, are not policy. Uh, we're actually going to talk about real technology um, and the ways that we're really using it. None of this ivory, ivory tower nonsense. Um, so first and foremost, uh, I want to say that cloud, generally speaking, um, regardless of what you may hear from uh, some of the fantastic vendors today, um, it's not there to save you money. Um, generally speaking, unless you're spending millions and millions of dollars uh, to refresh your legacy hardware on a regular basis, um, and you have a lot of old legacy systems, um, more of what you're going to get is capability um, and the capabilities it can enable for that business. Um, and that's relatively true at SBA, I would say, as well. Um, the investments we make in cloud are to enable new capabilities, um, not necessarily to do a like-for-like -like transition and get some sort of like dollar savings out of that. Um, regardless of what Vitara tells you, um, it's really more about capabilities than cost savings and avoidance. Um, so for us, some of the capabilities that we really need to unlock, um, as I mentioned before, we do disaster recovery. And that means that we um, surge our staff. We're one of the unique federal agencies, there's only a few of us, that dramatically hire up when there's an emergency. So we go from a staff of um, a little under 2,000 to, in this emergency, we hired about 5,000 new employees, uh, either detailees, contractors, uh, temporary term staff, 
um, just over the course of several weeks. Um, a lot of them were starting over the course of days. Um, and that's to help with the loan processing and some of the other things that we do here. Um, that is a unique challenge because uh, most federal agencies, people have uh, PIV cards and some of the other things that they need to be able to get online. They uh, get GFE, uh, government issued laptops and equipment. And we don't necessarily do that for all of our surge staff. Um, so we have to come up with other ways to enable these capabilities. Um, so one of the things that we do is we use um, a uh, cloud-based VPN solution that I'm not going to necessarily name any of the vendors that we use today, um, but uh, that enables us to have endpoints that are closer to our users where they are. Uh, which is really, really useful more than trying to do that traditional VPN, routing it through your M tips and having it swing back around um, and introducing a whole bunch of latency. For us, that means that uh, we have very, very fast connections. It means we can take advantage of express route and other things. Um, and it means that uh, people have streamlined access to all of our internal and external applications um, for our staff. That's been really, really valuable. Uh, another thing we've been taking advantage of is cloud-based virtual desktops. Um, this has been around for a couple of years. I think most people are familiar with virtual desktops, but this means that rather than um, expecting staff to have that government-issued laptop um, and having you have a PIV card to get access to our systems, we can use a multi-factor authentication of another type um, via uh, phone codes uh, or using like uh, an authenticator app. Um, to get a unique token um, to get into our systems. And they can do that through a virtual desktop on whatever laptop that they have available to them, desktop, whatever it happens to be. Um, this has been extremely powerful for us. Um, it's been really great, especially for detailees from other agencies um, where we've been able to do a hybrid where um, some of the, say, FEMA staff who are helping us out can use their existing PIVs on their government issued laptop from FEMA and still get into our systems through a virtual desktop. Um, it's been really powerful, really great. Um, other things that we've done, uh, we for a while have really embraced cloud-based security um, as sort of the front line for us. Um, we've uh, been one of the original pilots on the TIC3 uh, changes that were made. Uh, and we've also really embraced zero trust networking uh, in a very, very strong way. Um, and as an agency, that means that we get security visibility uh, across our data center, across our cloud instances, and across our desktop in one seamless uh, view that uh, is packaged together. So we can kind of see everything that's going on in our attack vectors, all of our different uh, potential risks, let's say, um, simultaneously, which has um, been really, really, really valuable. Um, I'll mention that uh, SBA does regular presentations of our security setup. Um, which is really innovative. Um, again, having come from OMB, I can say that we're pretty much on the bleeding edge for the federal government and we're really proud of what we've been able to accomplish. Um, we might not be having a lot of those here in the immediate future, just given everything else that's going on. Uh, but we do uh, do those regularly for federal staff. And uh, if you're interested, uh, you can follow up and like, get in touch with me uh, later on. Happy to put you in the queue for that. Um, one thing that's probably the obvious one to talk about here is that uh, because we are a bank, we have a lot of old legacy systems. Um, we do a lot of COBOL, we do a lot of cold fusion, we have systems that have been running for years and years and years. Um, and those aren't things necessarily that are the easiest in the world to modernize, especially these like uh, COBOL based systems, you know, spark based systems, there's really not an easy way to get that into the cloud. Um, and uh, you'll find the same thing from a lot of the banks that you'll hear as well. Um, it's pretty common. Um, the end result of that is that we can put uh, layers on top. There's a different uh, types of programming patterns that you can use here at After Patterns, Strangler Patterns, et cetera, um, that allow you to basically do that uh, cloud-based front door on top of all of your existing legacy hardware. And that means not all of that load is then gonna be hammering those systems. Um, so instead of having to buy you know, millions of dollars of hardware, uh, you can actually have all of uh, these cloud layers on top. Um, and that really, really helps with uh, dealing with all the extra traffic that we received. Um, and uh, has been really, really valuable to us. Um, other agencies are already doing that, but uh, again, you don't have to modernize your entire stack all at once. Um, you can slice off individual pieces, whether that's through microservices or just putting um, a caching layer on top. There's a lot of options here um, and recommended trying to do that if you find yourself in another emergency like this one. Um, one other thing I'll mention really, really briefly uh, is, um, Using things like uh, chatbots uh, has been popular uh, and useful for us. I know a lot of people are talking about AI and RPA and things like that. Um, these days, that's kind of the, the buzzword that everybody's into these days. Um, for us, chatbots work pretty well because we have um, really good data architecture in the first place. But um, chatbots are just another way for people to get access to information. It's about discoverability. 
And if your users, customers coming in um, can't just find things by Googling on your site, they're probably not going to get the full advantage of a chatbot either. Um, you really have to have done your data architecture really well for those to be valuable for an agency. Um, but we've had a pretty decent success for that and we'll probably increase our usage of them in the future as well. Um, one last thing uh, I wanna mention as a success, um, just a quick uh, shout out as it were. Um, we really believe in GSA shared services. We think they're really great. I think uh, Dominic from TTS is gonna be speaking later on today. Um, but uh, we really have been embracing uh, login.gov, uh, which we think is fantastic. I mean, it's 2020, y'all. Uh, it just makes sense for the US government to have a federated solution for identity and uh, logging in. Um, it doesn't make sense for your customers to have to go to 150 different websites with 150 different logins. Um, so we really believe in login.gov and SBA is really, really doubling down on that these days. Um, can't talk about the good stuff without talking about some of the lessons learned real quick. Um, I'll say this, uh, as I mentioned before, legacy systems, you can't always lift and shift those to the cloud. And if you do, it's not always gonna be cost effective. Um, so like I said, we do still have some legacy systems. We do still run data centers right now. Um, and I know a lot of other federal agencies are in a similar boat. Um, that's not necessarily bad. You know, in Cloud Smart, we really embrace the notion that you're going to have multi-cloud, you're gonna have hybrid, and that is how the federal government needs to do business. Um, if you're paying for your data ingress and egress and backups um, and all the compute uh, and storage costs, if you have a lot of data like we do, you know, 30 years of uh, loan data that we have to keep and persist, um, it's not always going to make sense to move all of that to the cloud. Um, so you really have to be pragmatic. You really need to use those calculators that uh, the uh, providers give you um, and really make sure that you have a clear understanding um, of what you're paying for and what you're getting um, and doing that full total cost of ownership, um, the reskilling component of what it's gonna cost to train your staff versus hiring in uh, SREs, which are way more expensive than data center practitioners. Um, so you just really need to do the calculus there to figure that out. Um, I'll also mention that uh, obviously we're moving into a new world of new security paradigms. If you really wanna talk about that, this is probably not the best track for it. There's other tracks that'll cover that in better detail like the DevSecOps track, et cetera. But uh, stay tuned because cloud is still important for new security models. So again, I'd mentioned the tick three changes that have come out, um, zero trust networking. There's a lot more that we can do to protect our data uh, closer to where it is. Um, and that's been really valuable for us rather than the old fashioned castle and moat. Um, but it does have new paradigms that goes along with it. And you have to plan for that. If you have legacy applications that have certain expectations around security, um, that can conflict uh, with the new security that you're trying to roll out. I'm not gonna go into great detail about that. Uh, because this is not the time or place, and we probably need to, you know, be in a secure environment. But um, it's definitely something to keep in mind when you're doing your planning. Um, another thing I'll mention is that uh, you really have to make sure that if you're rolling out these new solutions, um, PaaS, IaaS, uh, SaaS, um, that your team understands what you're doing and what you're buying and why you're building it the way that you are. Um, you can't take anything for granted. Um, I've seen a lot of places where they try to outsource everything, and that's just a recipe for failure. Um, that's never going to work. You have to build that subject matter expertise and knowledge um, inside of your own agency um, if it's gonna be successful because your existing IT staff understand how your systems work to a degree that outside contractors are never going to get. Um, also be really uh, careful if you're just gonna go with your incumbent vendor um, because that can be <laughs> tricky. Um, I've seen that be problematic when you just wanna give money to an existing contract but those people don't have any knowledge of how say serverless works and you're all in on serverless and the first instance works and then you know you don't have statefulness so the next one falls over and burns down and sinks into the swamp um so you just have to be really careful so thinking about your skilling uh thinking about your training um those are really really important um and factoring again all of that into your total cost of ownership when you're doing the math um last thing i want to mention really briefly and then i'm going to take a couple of questions really quickly um is that uh you know, I, given everything else that's going on in the world, um, I'm not gonna get political. That's not my place to be here. Um, and I'm not speaking for SBA or ATARC or any other organization when I talk about this stuff. Um, but it's important to realize that all technology is inherently political in one way or another. Um, and the reason that really applies to the emerging tech uh, conversation in particular is um, computers are really good at pattern matching. Um, and when you're doing automation, you're reproducing existing patterns, generally speaking, when we're talking about RPA, AI, all of these sorts of things. Um, and so if there's inherent bias in the way that you do business that you aren't necessarily aware of, um, the computer is just going to repeat that same bias and it's going to amplify it um, and it's gonna make it quicker. And that's extremely problematic. Um, 
and I'll say this, uh, as a personal practitioner, um, your systems probably do have bias in one way or another. Um, they probably have issues that you should consider. Um, I've seen on government websites regularly that uh, they don't allow apostrophes or accent marks in um, name fields, for instance. Um, on US passports, accents actually don't show up because of that, uh, the systems. And again, that's a, that's a systems level decision. Um, that's not a policy decision necessarily. Um, but if you're having those sorts of things where you can't accurately input somebody's name into a system, if that high level of basic form validation is unable to be done at a federal agency, it's a given that there are other decision systems underneath that. There are other things going on where you've introduced bias and you might not be aware of it. Um, so you really have to have those feedback loops. You really have to be uh, careful of making sure that you are responding to your customers, um, using customer experience and CX CAC goals to make sure you're hearing people um, when they're having issues. That's, that's really critical if you're gonna use any emerging tech um, to make sure that you're not uh, continuing to persist the same problems. All right. That's my soapbox. I'll stand back down off of it. Uh, thank you for putting up with me through that rant. Um, I'll go through a couple of questions here that we have in the queue real quick. Uh, one question that I've got here is, um, how did you solve for mobile access if surge employees don't have GFEs? Um, a couple of different ways, and it depends on uh, the level of credentialing for each of those staff members. Um, so like I said before, we have uh, government staff members who are detailees. So they've already got a background check. We already know that they have a PIV card. Um, they have their own GFE from another agency. So we know that we have a secure end to end on one end of it. Um, and again, since we are moving to zero trust networking, we're more concerned about making sure that the data is protected, not necessarily that they have a secure pipe between the two. Um, we still have a secure pipe, just to be clear. Uh, but um, for us, it's about making sure that we have a secure encrypted connection. Um, so using these alternative VPN sort of solutions and using virtual desktop solutions um, have been really, really effective. Um, and again, for staff who aren't necessarily government staff who are contractors or whatever, um, once they've gone through their security background and clearance, um, for us being able to use a different type of multi-factor is the easiest way to get them boots on the ground up and running during an emergency. Um, I wouldn't do it for long term necessarily. I don't think that not having a PIV card is a good idea. Uh, sorry, too many double negatives. Having a PIV card is a good idea. Um, but multi-factor in an emergency, especially for your remote workers, for instance, who don't have access to uh, their PIV card, they've been locked out, the PIV card expires, um, using an authenticator type uh, single token use can be extremely valuable in a way to do it. Um, let's see here, uh, other questions. Oh, uh, with respect to mobile, you're only referencing PC, not mobile in the sense of iPhone as an example, correct? Um, yes, uh, it gets a little bit more tricky um, with credentials for things like iPhone, Android, and et cetera. You can do derived credentials um, on those devices. Um, obviously, no one currently is sticking a PIV card into their phone. Um, so it's a slightly different equation there. Um, and we do use derived credentials, generally speaking, for that sort of purpose. Um, that works pretty well. Um, I'm sure that that will continue to evolve. Um, the providers are giving us more and more opportunities. You know, you can have a phone that has split sides so that you can have your personal stuff and you can have your work stuff and it keeps those in sandboxes. That's been really nice as well for security standpoint. Um, but at some point, uh, if you are issuing the government phones, um, then you can at least control that image. Um, we're not generally letting people use uh, bring your own device when it comes to cell phones. Um, instead, we do alternative methods of using Skype calling or other sort of things. So. Um, no BYOD on general devices. Let's see here. Um, I'm not seeing, um, oh, uh, okay. I've got time for one more, uh, and I'll just really quickly cover this. Uh, could you discuss how the cloud helped during the surge of traffic during PPP? Great question. Um, for PPP, there was uh, a lot of new processes that we tried to put in place to make sure that people were able to get their loans quickly and effectively. And we actually used a variety of different technologies there. Um, I can't get into every single detail of everything that we did, but between having um, a layer of extra caching and cloud security up front, um, using commercial off-the-shelf software for uh, inputting of um, the loan details that we need to process, um, and then being able to put that into um, an automated system, uh, low-code, no-code sort of solution for 
processing through our agents so that it could then be uh, dealt with quickly and effectively to know whether or not your thumbs up or thumbs down on your loan um, was really effective for us. So we used pretty much all of the different layers between platform as a service, software as a service, infrastructure as a service um, to unlock the capabilities uh, through cloud um, to enable us to be able to do those PPP loans, um, again, at an unprecedented volume. We've never seen anything like it. Okay, well, uh, I know I talk fast. I know we've covered a lot. Um, I appreciate everybody for their time. Uh, and now I'm going to hand things off. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Be safe. Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Suter. I'm the founder of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. And we have with us today, Todd Crossland, Head of Healthcare and Life Sciences at Snowflake. How are you doing today, Todd? Doing great, thanks for having me. Great, looking forward to your presentation. All right, thank you very much again, and we'll dive right into it. So again, thanks for having us be part of, this, part of your event, we really appreciate it. What I'm gonna do is basically walk through a quick run through about, about Snowflake as an organization, and then I'll dive into you know, how we're able to assist um, entities in, in the federal space in, in responding to things like COVID-19. So uh, really quickly in the history of Snowflake, we were founded back in 2012 um, as a brand new database and a data warehouse built for the cloud. Since then, we've evolved quite a bit and just recently announced our, our cloud data platform, which I'll show here visually in just a second. Uh, lots of, of, of support from the likes of Salesforce from a funding perspective, uh, and we're now a stalwart in the Gartner uh, Magic Quadrant. Very proud of our NPS score down there. Originally it was 71 several years ago, and now we've moved all the way up to a 74. Industry average obviously being around a 21. So what we see and, and what everyone knows from a data landscape perspective today, it's very complex, it's very disjointed and very siloed, uh, but that's kind of what we're, from a Snowflake data platform perspective, is, is, is solving for many, many organizations around the world today. Uh, the way we do that um, is via a platform as a service. And the key and the differentiator for Snowflake is that we are a service. And so the concept of a data platform that allows you to pour data in, not having to allocate space, you simply copy data into Snowflake, you fire up independent compute, clo compute clusters uh, and compute nodes that can run concurrently. So being able to feed data in and query data out of, a, of our platform is very important. I'll mention that we are a, a relational, columnar, you know, ANSI SQL database, full asset compliant, uh, with lots of tools around security and governance, uh, and lots of compliance in the, in the spaces of healthcare and life sciences. Uh, and so uh, fully HIPAA compliant, high trust certified, and what have you. So that platform and, and where we've evolved again, we think about Snowflake was a data warehouse, and now you see uh, the, the realm and the expansion in Data Lake into engineering, into transforming data on top of Snowflake, uh, attaching data science capabilities with Python and R and SAS uh, into Snowflake, building applications. Uh, I, I was a customer of Snowflake and built several applications on top. And then data exchange, and I'll talk about that as specifically as it has dealt with COVID-19. Another important aspect of Snowflake is we are cloud agnostic. Um, so we are public cloud only, but you see there that you have the likes of Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure. We run on, all, on top of all three. So in healthcare and life sciences, we're broad across all the different uh, sub-industries of, of healthcare and life sciences. Uh, I won't go through any of all of these, but just know that we have a presence uh, across all of that. So where I'm going to go in, in COVID-19 is understand a concept of, of data sharing and what we do uh, at Snowflake is instead of FTP, because we are cloud and because we are multi-tenant, you're able to have data be accessed from a data provider can share to a data consumer and you're accessing a live data set. You're not accessing a copy. You're not getting a copy of data via an API. And so that's an important aspect of, uh, of what Snowflake uh, and the capabilities that people are using in response to COVID-19. So how's that happening? And, and, and so one of those mechanisms via that sharing is what's known as our marketplace uh, for data. And I'm gonna talk about star schema over here. So what you have in essence is this app store for data 
that allows organizations to go out and attach themselves to live data assets globally around the world. Uh, it can be a kind of a freemium model uh, where you go in and get a sample data set and then get a more robust data set. Uh, the key thing here is this is not a data lake full of, of files that you have to ETL yourself. This is a, a live access to a governed database. We also offer a private version of this, which allows organizations to have their own private data exchange versus a public data marketplace. So for COVID-19, you know, what are, what are, what are entities and, and both private and, and, and government entities doing, you know, and how we responded as a, as a group uh, to COVID-19. And the first example of that and, and has, has been a huge thing and a value for, for uh, over 900 organizations around the world is what's called the Star Schema data set. Star Schema is a partner of Snowflake. We're actually based out of Hungary, uh, but they realized early on as our marketplace first came online is when COVID-19 hit and they said, wow, we should take a lot of the data sources out there um, and aggregate those data assets into a live database and let's let that be shared out to the world. And so what you have now is this, all the public data sets from Johns Hopkins to data from Italy, from Germany, Belgium, Canada, right? All these, obviously from the US, uh, these, all these data assets have been aggregated and joined within one Snowflake database and now shared. So today, this data is being replicated across all three public clouds, over 40, it's up to 20 now regions around the world. And so whenever any one of the data sets changes, then every organization that is subscribing to this live data set is now able to access that data. So we think for any organization, whether, you know, any, 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 you know, retail organization to any government organization can gain value and many have, and I'll dive more into that in some specific examples here shortly. So, uh, some examples and, and, and of who's using Snowflake, um, California, we have a blog post on this, uh, California is utilizing Snowflake as a single source of truth uh, from a pandemic response perspective. I have kind of a screenshot uh, of what they're providing to the public with, our, with their, their and our partner Tableau, which allows the, the public to be informed of what's happening specifically in California. Uh, it's also important that they're using our data sharing mechanism out to their to their local and county uh, governments so that they can now have a more informed response in those municipalities. Uh, so great, uh, great work being done there by the state of California uh, and great partnership there. Another example uh, is the COVID Alliance that we're a part of. Uh, this is a public private consortium uh, that has built a platform on top of Snowflake and other technologies. Uh, one part of that is their pandemic management platform. Uh, which again, all data coming in, contact tracing, uh, business recovery, you know, all, all different aspects of, of data and managing a pandemic response uh, can be done via that platform. Great example here is uh, in the country of the Czech, countries of the Czech Republic and Slovakia through our partner Kabula, um, they have a, a complete pandemic response uh, platform as well. Uh, that works with the call centers that are doing outreach for contact tracing. All of the data around contact tracing, around business response and, and where businesses should open up and where they shouldn't is all being run on the Snowflake platform as well via our partner Kabula. So a great example there and, and I think they've done a, you know, a country has done a, a pretty, pretty good job of, of managing the, the, the pandemic. Last one I'll, I'll speak of is, is here in the U.S. is the COVID-19 research database. Uh, this is a completely pro bono effort um, by ourselves and organizations like DataVant, Metadata, and many more. Uh, you can go out and, 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 and check out that research database. It is for clinical, non-commercial purposes only. So clinicians are able to go and register their interest uh, in, in accessing this, this data set. Um, it is a, a massive data set. These are just representative samples of, of the different types of data that are in this uh, large data set. Snowflake is able to handle this because of our elasticity and ability to take however many data sets into one spot and allow researchers to access it. I call out Symphony Health specifically because you notice they have a small Snowflake there. They're already a Snowflake customer. So when they joined this consortium, they simply turned on a data share and that data was immediately available for researchers to access. The other folks on the consortium that aren't Snowflake customers yet, they have to drop data into an S3 bucket, right, and then go and process the data through a data pipeline. So you can kind of see the, the, uh, 
the way that that works. So thank you very much. Tom, back to you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Todd. That's uh, cut out of the pages of the kinds of things we need with, uh, with this, you know, actually saving lives through this pandemic. Uh, very excited about your presentation. And uh, that was Todd Crossland, Head of Healthcare and Life Sciences uh, over at Snowflake. Thank you again, Todd. Very informative. Thank you again. Am I able to do a test yet? You're, Are you're you actually live. Me? I'm live. Yay. <laughs> hey. Yes. Yeah. Mm, so you can see me and hear me. Very good. Am I starting now? I yes. Okay. So I guess the last panel uh, finished early. And so I guess... Um, I guess we can start. Um, so welcome everybody to our cloud security panel. I actually need to bring the page up just to make sure um, I've got it. Uh, and so, you know, cloud security is a big topic for all of us here. Uh, and you've heard it mentioned quite a number of times in the keynotes and in the speakers previously. Um, but this session is uh, a little bit specifically focused. Um, we wanted to... Um, in one sense, we wanted to share uh, what's being done in um, what in the ATARC pilot, cloud uh, security pilot. Um, and so the, the, the focus there tends to be automation in the ATO process, the, the concept of DevSecOps uh, principles, um, zero trust, TIC 3.0. We're hitting quite a number of, um, of topics dear to our heart. So um, I'd like to say I think we have a great panel for this. Um, let me just introduce uh, very quickly uh, Dr. Michaela Iorga from NIST, uh, Brian Seaborg uh, from FDIC. Um, Adam from the DLA is not yeah, able yeah. to join us, uh, but Frank Lancaster from Fed Systems Checkpoint and Checkpoint's made some real headway in uh, cloud threats and vulnerabilities. So, uh, so these are the topics. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. And, um, and tell us a little bit about their interests. So, um, um, Dr. Ayoga, would, uh, would you take it first? Sure, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you uh, to all organizers for inviting us today. Um, I am a security, uh, senior security technical lead for cloud computing with NIST. And I wear several hats there that might be relevant to this conversation in the afternoon. I am the chair of the public uh, cloud security working group and the co-chair of the cloud forensic working group that are operating under a uh, NIST umbrella. I uh, also am the one of the government chairs of the cloud of the ATARC cloud working group. And one of the projects under that um, forum is going to be discussed here today. Uh, I have the great pleasure under uh, ATARC um, um, guidance and support to work closely with uh, Mari on this project, uh, the pilot that we are going to also introduce you all today. And more than anything, I would like also to uh, bring to your attention that one of the new projects that I have that is very dear to us that might make uh, news and become more and more important. I think it's one of the 
projects, the most significant project of my career so far is the Open Security Controls Assessment Language or OSCAL as we refer to it. So I will um, explain probably a little bit later when we discuss the pilot what that is, but uh, I'm uh, uh, very um, proud to, to announce that uh, due to the past three years of collaboration with uh, FedRAM, we managed to make tangible progress and we are ready to announce today the third milestone release that actually completes the features that we wanted for this project and how that can be leveraged is going to be discussed later today. Um, back to you, Mari. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, thank you, Michaela. Um, Brian, would you like to take it next? Sure. Um, I'm Brian Seaborg. I'm the I'm a one of the senior security architects and senior enterprise architects at FDIC. I have about 32 years in uh, computer security and about two years as an enterprise architect. Uh, at FDIC, we've um, authorized 23 different cloud service providers um, since 2017. Our first foray into it was uh, in around May of 2017, where we certified 18F as well as Office 365. And we've been um, certifying things on a fairly regular basis since then. So we have a fair amount of experience with cloud and cloud uh, service providers. And hopefully I'll share some of my thoughts on that and uh, things that you all can, can use and take away uh, as we get through the discussion today. Awesome, excellent. Thank you, Brian. Frank, um, you wanna take it next? Yeah, sure. Hi, Mari. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. You yeah. sound great. All right, thanks. Hi, Frank Lancaster here. I'm with Checkpoint Software Technologies. We are a longtime uh, service, I'm sorry, a longtime cybersecurity company, been around for over 25 years, and I've been with the company for some time now. In my particular role, I manage the federal system integrators. So I work with a, you know, a large team here at Checkpoint that uh, that works directly with federal government programs, but uh, me specifically working as a liaison with the integrators. Um, really pleased to be joined here today. I'm a member of the ATARC board as well and the influencers board. Um, uh, very honored to work with all of you on the panel here. Some of the things that I'd like to talk to you about today, and, and you all have hit on them some, uh, we're seeing you know, in these pandemic times a rush to lots of things. Uh, of bringing services to the cloud so that you can get services out to your remote workers. Uh, you can move people remote much, much more quickly. And we at Checkpoint have seen a lot of that as well. Um, we're seeing a lot in the DevOps world too, as uh, Maury had mentioned. Uh, the CI CD pipeline is moving fast and it's iterating rapidly. So there's new versions of code that are out. And with these new versions of code and microservices and containers, there's so many more opportunities for uh, you know, SQL injections threats to these new uh, threat vectors. So we wanna make sure and get the word out uh, is that you know, as infrastructure becomes, uh, I'm sorry, as code becomes your infrastructure, so too must security be. So shift left, uh, so th those are some of my important things that I like to talk about along with TIC 3.0, right? So with the guidance from CISA, there is now an opportunity for branches and even, you know, in a SASE kind of world, users to direct connect to the cloud without having to go through that hairpin back to the data center through that big monolithic security stack that, uh, that everyone trusts for enforcement. So that enforcement points moving closer uh, and, and allowing more direct access for these native cloud applications that we're finding. So uh, th these are areas that I like to talk about and, and have passion for. And uh, I'll, I'll kick it back to you. And thanks for allowing me to be part of this really great panel. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Frank. Um, so all very uh, positive interests and very applicable to this notion of emergency response in the federal space. And so let me go um, to Michaela and ask Michaela, what is the role that automation plays in the ATO process? And, and how do you feel that we're evolving towards a better place in this regard? Well, I think that it's absolutely critical to be able to develop processes, um, ANA processes that uh, employ automation 
to be able to uh, derive from that an agile a ATO uh, process. So uh, I would like to take this moment to actually and describe uh, the pilots that uh, you are uh, leading uh, under ATARC. This is something novel, something new that, and we are very grateful to ATAR for basically uh, providing uh, to us uh, the opportunity to come forward, several government and private sector agencies, uh, and uh, build something unique, something that we haven't tried before to pilot. So we have a lab and we, we are trying to build their uh, proofs of concept. At the very beginning, when we started with the um, working group and we divided in subgroups and focused for the cloud security on implementing something that is useful, we looked at our um, team members and we had representation from probably uh, 40 entities at the very beginning and uh, polled them, tried to find out what are the topics most interest to uh, your agency. So uh, the ones that came uh, forward were, one of them was Agile ATO. How can we uh, uh, implement uh, a, an Agile ATO process and gain confidence that the process delivers what is expected? The second one was uh, a zero trust architecture. And for many of us, and I don't want to insult any of the audience that we have out there that is already familiar with what zero trust architecture is. But I'd like to take a moment for the ones that heard us, including me, for a longest time, almost a decade, saying you have to trust your system, especially when you move to a cloud environment. As a government uh, agency, you are still responsible for your system, for your data. So you have to do everything in your power, gain any kind of visibility within the system and be able to assess and authorize the system. But more than anything, you have to trust that system. You have to trust that all the um, uh, security requirements are implemented and all the measures that are in place um, are appropriate and provide a, an appropriate fidelity um, uh, and security posture for your system. So coming then one day with a new concept of zero uh, trust, there are a lot of um, people out there that could not understand what we mean by that. And it, uh, it, it was quite confusing. The, the idea was that we reach a point where uh, the, um, the attack vectors were so broad and when we we're moving to the cloud that we had to shift and instead of looking at our perimeter and try to defend the perimeter, we had to come closer and closer and closer to the data. So the zero trust architecture is basically a collection, if you want, of uh, concepts, idea and, and component relationships that are designed in such a way that, pro that eliminate unauthorized access to the data into the services and more than anything allows also for a lower granularity of um, if possible of this access control enforcement so it became very important to all of us that try to see how can we deploy a zero trust environment that can defend um, a simple application that we have in place it was very important and then we had on uh, a third topic that uh, came to us and that was very important that was TIC 3.0. Well if you look at the zero trust architecture and if you uh, clearly understand that it was very easy for us to take a zero trust architecture something like open software defined perimeter uh, and identify the components and and implement basically a policy enforcement point and a policy decision point and protect the environment where we have a DevSecOps environment and we mimic the deployment of an application in that environment. So this is a very, very inter interesting project. I'm very excited to collaborate and very grateful. I would, like, I would like to give a shout out there to actually Waverly Labs and to 212 that are instrumental for the um, for this uh, implementation of this pilot. Now, 
the agile ATO. So what do we what do we want to and what does it mean? I would like to be able to automate the assessment process, and this is where uh, we are going to demonstrate and employ the open uh, automation of the assessment process with the Open Security Controls Assessment Language or OSCAL. So OSCAL was born about five years ago out of my frustration, I can tell you that much. I was going uh, around and trying to uh, guide government agencies from my role at NIST of how to approach and how to adopt uh, uh, securely and safely uh, trustworthy cloud-based solutions. And I kept saying that you need to have that level of transparency, you need to understand what is that you are acquiring to be able to trust the system, to be able to authorize the system to, to operate. But that was so impossible, so hard to do without having automation, with having, without having embedded components that will be able to report to you that um, the fidelity rigor of all the capabilities that are in place uh, didn't change, was not altered. And being able not only to authorize and to, to assess and to authorize the system on day one and reauthorize it later, having that snapshot in, in front of you and when you make the analysis, but also to be able to integrate uh, all this um, information and to automate the continuous monitoring process as much as possible. So when I came out with the idea, everybody, um, there are lots of people saying that we have already something like this. We have already uh, machine readable formats for um, 853. So what OSCAL is actually is a set of standardized formats in machine readable format in XML, uh, JSON, and YAML derived from uh, JSON that allow you to represent, to represent the security information, in particular, the catalog of controls, the baselines, we refer to them as profiles, that you can modify the system security plan and with a, a milestone three release the system assessment plan, the system, um, the poems, and the system assessment um, results. So the language is designed, we re I refer to it as a language because this is how I perceive that, even though OSCAL uh, has the word language in there. It's a machine readable format. It's something that you can, will help you to employ uh, tools to extract and build the traceability all the way within the stack. So when, when you implement the system, and you represent that information in machine readable format without duplicating information, you can easily just point to the profile, to the controls that you are um, importing if you want for your system, the ones that you want to implement. And those are going to implicitly point to the catalog from where uh, the controls are um, extracted. And then the system assessment plan built on top of the system security plan, same with the system assessment results and the points. The most important thing here is the flexibility that the language provides. And it, it's one of the most important uh, features there. It allows you to represent not only 153 controls because we have many agencies there that have to show, um, to, uh, show compliance uh, against multiple regulatory frameworks. So you can represent ISO controls in the, the same language without, without any changes. You can represent COBIT uh, 5 controls, we tested that and many others. So this is what, um, as a NIST uh, representative, I brought forward to this pilot, and we're trying to leverage uh, for the automation and to proof of concept OSCAL uh, to demonstrate an agile ATO. Also, the zero trust architecture is the one that we have in place and, uh, and the DevSecOps. We want to be able to have an environment where we can demonstrate all those features and uh, have other agencies to see how these things were done as a proof of concept. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you, Michaela. Um, so what I want to do is I want to leverage on what uh, Michaela talked about. Uh, in terms of OSCAL and the automation of the documentation. And so maybe, Brian, you could take the question related to um, the DevSecOps pipeline and the processes we want to automate, in particular, as we deploy systems to the cloud. 
So um, I think the the OS call work that Michaela is um, leading is very important. One of the things that we uh, saw early on from a cloud monitoring perspective is each of the cloud providers, and I'm sure many of you who are attending this call have had this experience if you've gone through the process, they provide their documentation as far as their security assessment reports, their security plans, their POAMs uh, in different formats and sometimes via different platforms. And in some cases, uh, they're in a very unusable format. So for example, we had one cloud provider, I won't name them here to avoid embarrassing them, uh, that provided a spreadsheet of all of their controls in, in a large PDF that was printable. So imagine imagine a, a printing a spreadsheet on a printer where the number of columns exceeds the column width of the printer. And that's what they dumped into a PDF. So we actually spent 12 real hours going through that to actually decompose that into a spreadsheet that was usable. And we did get out of the, um, the vendor the ability for them to provide those POAMs in a, P, in a uh, Excel spreadsheet format from then on. But that, I think, kind of emphasizes how important this work is to be able to, if you're really going to be able to automate this and to uh, scale this up, I, I saw some agencies that had 50 plus cloud providers. So could you imagine um, every month, some of the cloud providers provide a monitoring call. So you're going to have to have somebody sit on a monitoring call for 50 different cloud providers. It just doesn't scale. So when you're talking about you know, an automated build deploy pipeline, and you're also talking about security monitoring from a continuous monitoring perspective, having a common framework like the OSCAL is attempting to provide will be incredibly important to us because ultimately we want to all have probably a real time capability of looking at what the status of our cloud providers is just like we currently can monitor our existing networks. Right, so you can imagine that that that's really uh, something that's exciting that I'm looking at uh, as uh, I continue to monitor the OSCAL framework uh, that comes forward. So I'm very excited about it. It's something that addresses a need that we've identified because if you're going to do continuous monitoring uh, in in a DevOps framework, you want to have a dashboard and. The only way to have a dashboard that really shows the current security posture of these systems is to, to have uh, automated tools and a common language in a machine readable format that can be bringing that type of information to you along with your own uh, continuous monitoring for those controls that each of the agencies are responsible for. Um, so I guess that's, I'll stop there and uh, and just say that I think this is uh, very incredibly important and I would recommend to anyone to read the OSCAL specs that are out there. And I'm following uh, what Michaela is doing with uh, great interest. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Um, Frank, let's go to you. Let's, uh, keep, let's keep pulling on this thread, um, but let us have you talk to us about the other things we need to think about as we run a DevSecOps pipeline, automating various aspects, uh, but making sure that when we deploy, we're secure in the cloud. I know Checkpoint's done a lot of uh, security and threat-based um, uh, analytics, and so maybe you could um, talk to us about, about you know, threats in the pipeline and things to really consider as we build our pipeline and we automate. Yeah, uh, sure, Mari. Uh, so what we see uh, is that with shift left, we want to shift security left as well. So it's important. So uh, also, as uh, Brian and, and Michaela and others have, have talked about, um, you, 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 there's cyber hygiene that you have to have in your traditional network data center security. You know, you check for patches, you do all of that. Well, all that has to happen in the cloud, in the CICD pipeline as well. So we recommend that, uh, that there's some overarching kind of posture management that goes out and checks all these many assets that are in the cloud because it's, and it needs to be automated because you can't do this at scale like you used to be able to in your, in your network data center. So automation is critical, um, posture management is critical, 
and also uh, code scanning, checking your code early and often to make sure that it's hardened. And then once it is hardened and then you have templates that you apply automation to that to, to, uh, to remove problems that are introduced with the human element. And, you know, you asked a couple of things, you know, early on us in the dialogue, what were some of our key concerns? And that's really one from Checkpoint and, and from the industry uh, in general is that the human element, Gartner says 95% in 2020 of the cloud breaches will be at, as a result of the human element, be that either malicious or, uh, or you know, accidental, most likely. Uh, but automation takes care of that, scanning takes care of that, and posture management. So with posture management, I, I'm, I'm really talking about something that's looking at the privileges of all of these assets and objects that are in the cloud, that are looking about uh, the inter uh, interplay between objects, which ones are exposed uh, to things like the internet where they don't, you know, you don't want the bad actors to get in. So something that does that and shows you in, in a heat map kind of form uh, where all this stuff, uh, where your exposures lie, where your criticality issues lie. And it does that continuously and reports back up to a platform like you guys are talking about with OSCAL. Uh, I haven't been involved with that. It sounds very intriguing. But the, the, these are things that, uh, that, that we try to, uh, you know, push upon our clients and, 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 and work with them as experts that they really need to do as they are uh, as they are implementing DevOps. The speed of DevOps is extraordinary now. There used to be, you know, you could bring up a, a couple of, of VMs in the cloud and then a day later, it's, it's that times 100. So you need to have your security working right along. And if your infrastructure is code, your security is code. It needs to be pushed to the left and enforced very hard with uh, procedures and uh, that that's kind of what we're finding and we encourage everyone to stop by our booth we are a sponsor so check us out there's lots of papers and uh, white papers and the sort not just sales stuff uh, for you for you to digest thank you mm -hmm. Mari, may I interject? Yeah. yes absolutely well, because we discuss about threats one of the I would like to share two of the visions that I have related to actually to Oscar is the foundation work uh, that we put uh, there, not just assessment automation, but but I think that with OSCAL in place and employing uh, OSCAL to monitor systems for and to diagnose system, I think my vision is that we will be able to shift more and more towards a threat-based uh, approach, uh, risk management, because when you secure a system and you express all this information, um, describing how you secure the system, how are you going to assess the system, you make that decision based on uh, a set of threats that you um, are trying to defend against. So do you want to make your system um, resilient, defendable against a, a set of threats that you identified that uh, the system might be subject? Well, imagine that you are able to uh, articulate clearly in machine readable format that those are the threats that you were uh, cognizant of at the very beginning when you uh, architected the system and as you monitor the system during the operation times you can have a feed into the entire many control if you want a dashboard where uh, the tools are going to report uh, all the findings and will tell you there is a zero day a new thread out there or uh, your sys the, the something happened, the threat vectors change, and you will be able to employ tools that will tell you, hey, my system is resilient to those kind of threats, or my system is in jeopardy and I will need to act fast. This is one of the things that I think we can achieve, that we can go there. It's one of my visions. The second one is, as the system become more complex, and nobody can argue that they are not even today, but they are going to grow in complexity and we'll have to deal with system of systems. The human brain is going to become not capable of having a very clear picture, accurate picture of the connectivity and the relations between the systems. Um, a machine readable format that can store your information like OSCAL can be leveraged because it's already a tagged uh, data can be leveraged to employ artificial intelligence to help you with uh, any kind of analysis, cybersecurity analysis that you want to put in place for your system. So those are two um, new branches, if you want, uh, uh, that could uh, take off or could be developed having OSCAL 
as a foundation. Right. So having Oscar uh, to give us the tag data set to feed the dashboards that Frank referenced, right? Michaela, is your point? Right. Um, okay, so I want to key on something else that Michaela brought up, this notion of system of systems. So look at what we've actually done to ourselves. Um, we're bringing in zero trust. Um, we introduced the cloud to extend our data centers in some cases. Um, and in now more and more cases, we're introducing cloud uh, for SaaS services because there's such a great and rich application set out there. Uh, and so we want to use it and leverage it. Um, but now the simple tasks like user onboarding um, or even system onboarding, say, say not in the context of a DevSecOps pipeline, um, but now I've got all of these systems to sort of synchronize the cybersecurity policy with regard to, right, the zero trust system, maybe a CASB cloud access and security broker, um, the IDAM or ICAM systems in the cloud, um, and with my various SaaS providers. I may even have an identity provider, third party. We mentioned gov um, login.gov in the last discussion uh, or, or talk. Um, so what is this doing to the complexity of our systems for normal governance and, and administration activities? And where why, might we be needing to go in automation? Uh, I'd like to direct that to Frank and, and Brian. Yeah, Frank, hi, this you is want to Frank. Go first and then I'll jump in. Yeah, yeah sure, Brian. Uh, so, you know, all of that with uh, you, you mentioned ICAM and IM access and CASB and and SAS and a lot of a lot of cool cloud kind of words that um, you know that are resonating with all these SAS applications. You you need to employ a CASB and you need to have some sort of uh, identity access management that because privilege and identity are are really go hand in hand with the security here. And that's kind of plays into what I was talking about earlier with posture management. Uh, you need to make sure things have just in time, least amount of privileges, and then they are escalated and de-escalated when they need be. Um, you know, certainly uh, as, as, as government agencies uh, move to pure born in cloud SaaS, they'll need to look at CASB type and software gateways. Um, to, uh, to, to enforce their security as their workloads move that way. So, um, you know, at Checkpoint, we, we, we think what you said is right on and that we're looking forward to talking to you about it at our booth, but uh, I'll, I'll let Brian kind of expound on it. All I can say is that what you, you know, is that we are finding exactly the same thing. Identity access management and privilege management are very, very essential. Brian, you want to take it? Thanks, Frank. So, so what all? Sure. So what I'll say on the topic is a couple of things. One is um, we're, we're trying as we bring on cloud services to expound single sign on to those. So we're using SAML assertions. Uh, we're also looking at OAuth, of course, for, for those uh, systems that, that support that so that you don't have this disaster from a user experience perspective of people uh, realizing that they're logging into 50 different platforms that really, as far as they're concerned, they have a single uh, cockpit at their desktop. And as they navigate from one cloud system or on-prem system to another, it, it, it's just really a, a matter of navigating either to a new URL or, or clicking on a, a new interface. And, and it looks seamless to them from a user experience perspective where they don't have to log in over and over again. One of the, Things that we have to do though is we also have to simplify administration in those different cloud environments and so there's a protocol out there called skim uh, system for cross-domain identity management and there are a lot of um, vendors out there that are developing provisioning interfaces apis that are skim compliant so when you're looking at cloud uh, providers you should be looking to see whether they are skim compliant because that will make you uh, able to use your provisioning systems that also support SCIM uh, to be able to provision users to those uh, using essentially a RESTful API interface uh, for connecting up and provisioning users. And also to be able to do queries for certification to see what are the effective privileges of people 
in those 50 different cloud platforms, plus all your legacy systems, which is also a critical piece of the overall zero trust, as well as continuous monitoring, that you're not giving people more privileges than they need, and that you can actually manage this complexity um, using automated tools. So that would be another thing to look at uh, as well. I'd also mention, give a plug to MITRE for the attack framework that they have and, and the GovArc initiative that's happening uh, where they're looking at uh, a risk-based approach, you know, looking at the different attack chains that could, that are kill chains that you could have for specific attack types. And you can then decide if I'm going to implement something and I have a fixed amount of money to implement things, where should I put my money? You know, what's what's the biggest bang for the buck? So is it is it implementing a CASB? Is it implementing two-factor authentication? Uh, is it an email proxy? You know, you, you can look at um, that framework to try and help you to make best decisions with respect to limited funds and resources. Uh, I might add, thanks, um, uh, Brian. I might add, um, now there's attack for cloud out of the MITRE attack frame uh, matrix. So uh, that's just a positive thing. Um, okay, so thank you for that. I want to go back to one thing on Oscal, um because it's something I recently learned with doc, uh, Dr. Iorga on our pilot with ATARC, um, and that is this, this capability to show the control inheritance from the various uh, SSPs. Somebody mentioned that um, um, we may be using multiple cloud providers to do certain things. And so in the pilot, we're using an IAAS cloud provider. We're using a zero trust uh, 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 a cloud access service provider. Um, and then we're, we're reusing an application actually built by someone else. So Michaela, could you talk to us just real quick about, about the power in Oscal and its ability to roll up the various controls so you can understand the lineage of inheritance? Absolutely. So the way when uh, the way uh, Federum operated uh, when we're doing assessment on, uh, um, I refer to them intermediate provider. Think of. Uh, cloud services that are building their solution on top of another uh, cloud provider like uh, like AWS. So this is what we are also uh, simulating in our environment. So we have an infrastructure as a service. So the, the way at this point in time when you build that solution, leveraging the authorization of another uh, cloud service provider, you received from them because this is what FedRAM is uh, requiring from them um, uh, customer responsibility metrics. So you know what are the controls that um, become common to you because they are implemented, you are inheriting because the uh, cloud uh, service provider that you're sitting on um, have them already implemented and you get the list of the controls that become your responsibility or the controls that are split responsibilities. So, and you have to demonstrate how you implement them. However, from that position of sitting on top of another service, you have absolutely no visibility uh, into beyond the list of, or what was given to you of how exactly these controls are implemented. When the assessment is done, of course, the two packages for provisional ATOs are linked together. And if you go on FedRAM's marketplace today, or even for any agency, uh, the good practice will say, if you authorized uh, this um, software as a service that sits on uh, another cloud provider, um, let's say AWS, you have to link the two together. What OSCAL allows you to do, because it's machine readable format and allows you to a point in your upper stack of the information, if you want, to uh, the information on the lower stack without having that in front of you when you develop that. It allows the stack to be built in front of the entity that is allowed to see the full stack, like third party assessors or a government agency that wants to evaluate the entire stack and to resolve, if you want, all the controls of the entire set of information. So they're becoming in a way transparent from the point of the uh, entity that is assessing the entire stack or uh, from the point of the 
government agency that uh, is adopting one of those uh, solutions for their uh, use and are going through the process of, of reviewing the entire package to convert that provisional ATO into an um, uh, agency ATO. Awesome, thank you, Michaela. So I think the point and the reason for the focus on automation in this, in this context with regard to the summit um, is that automation can help us get to the cloud quicker, help us deploy uh, quicker, certainly in the assessment and ATO process. Um, so let me ask Brian, because he represents an organization that recently had to do a quick move to the, um, uh, to the cloud to support, uh, uh, well, actually before the COVID hit, right? But, but so automation in the ATO process, Brian, and how it helps us to respond to federal emergencies or federal uh, have a, an effective federal response to emergency. Um, where do you see us going and how did that work for you? So I think uh, we, we were fairly lucky um, as an organization because about five years ago, we did a pandemic plan as part of our disaster recovery and emergency response uh, work and we identified at that time that had we to go and work from home for the entire FDIC there's no way that we had the capacity within our communications infrastructure to be able to support that so we we fixed that uh, several years ago and uh, otherwise we've <clears throat> also been very lucky so it happened that it was about three months prior to COVID that we had deployed Microsoft Teams so from a collaboration perspective, we had a cloud service in place that we could use and, and are using quite a bit. Uh, in fact, we now prefer that to um, calling on the phone, right? And, and a lot of people have experienced the same thing with Zoom, so I'm not telling you anything that you haven't experienced with other platforms, but it beats the heck out of a cell phone call where you're sitting there you know, on a squeaky mic or, or something like that. Um, so, so the other thing that we did is everybody at FDIC has a GFE provided laptop. So we don't have desktops anymore. We only have laptops. And um, so everybody was uh, outfitted with a PIV enabled laptop GFE uh, that they could take home and uh, appropriate iPhones uh, so that we could have mobilization. So a lot of that was lucky. Now, there's some other stuff that we would like to have been able to do right away like for example all of us as federal agencies are looking at uh, the 21st century act the idea uh, and trying to make sure that we start using electronic signatures significantly more within our work processes because that's one of the last milestones that we have to get over to fully automate a lot of systems right because if we have a system that works fairly well but then you have have to print out a form, sign it, scan it back in, and and then you know email it or or, or send it around via interoffice mail to people. Uh, you're not automating your processes, right? So um, we would like to have uh, been able to bring electronic signature capabilities from a cloud service provider in much quicker. But because we don't have the OSCOL framework in place yet, and because we don't have the degree of automation that we would like to have that ATO process is still very slow. Um, and, and it took us probably about three months to get just a limited ATO. And we recently did it for DocuSign. Um, and that's not their fault. It's our fault for our own processes inside of the FDIC. So automating the ATO process, as Michaela pointed out, is definitely a sore point for a lot of people. And if we can make that fast, with the, which there's no reason that it shouldn't be fast, uh, and automated, and we can do all of the other forms, the PTAs, the PIAs, you know, all the privacy stuff and other artifacts, um, then, then those are the things that are really going to allow us to be more agile and to adopt cloud and other types of services very quickly and put them into full operational status with a, a, a good ATO and confidence that the assessment and, and the controls are matching what our risk uh, appetite is so that's something that I would t I would say is something that still is a challenge for us 
Excellent, yes, uh, I see the same thing. Uh, let me move to Frank and ask Frank um, to talk about his experience in watching his government sponsors or customers move to zero trust in regard or in relationship to the COVID-19. Um, I know in many cases, um, the zero trust providers are getting um, considerable uh, screenplay, so to, so to speak. They're in many pilots um, and their products are in demand in many ways because of COVID and because of the move to the mobile worker requirement. So Frank, what have you seen and, and are there any fears you want us to recognize uh, or cautions to think about as, uh, as we adopt zero trust? Yeah, um, one uh, quick shout out to the good folks at NIST uh, for their framework, the 800-207 zero trust framework. That's, I believe it's in draft, it's up, it's a good read uh, for draft geeks like me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so working with, working with um, our, our federal customers and our industry partners, uh, integrators and the like, uh, we've seen uh, and echoing some of the things that you guys have said, agile, compliance, uh, zero, zero trust. Uh, we've seen that um, they're, they're moving at, at a very measured pace and that being most of them have been previous customers of ours. So like with the pandemic hit, uh, we were offering uh, VPN licenses as that's one of the things that we provide to our customers. And uh, most of them were covered by uh, our, you know, our very uh, high level of threat protection within that. So um, there's a certain, uh, no one wants to end up on the cover of the Washington Post now, right? So there's a very uh, strong um, commitment to compliance and to, uh, to process and to uh, adopting these, these technologies, uh, you know, that a lot of our, um, our competitors, as well as we uh, bring to bear in the zero trust marketplace. So we, uh, we're seeing a lot of a lot of compliance and a lot of people onboarding into that. So it's a it's a good time to be in that business now, and uh, we're working very closely with all of our customers. Some things to be careful with are just you know making sure you're following good cyber hygiene. I've mentioned already the human element. You know when we're talking about the CI/CD part of it, it's it's automation, it's hardening, it's template. Uh, when we're talking about any of that, especially in a multi-cloud environment, you really need to have some overarching. Um, you know, uh, management, posture management that looks for privilege and looks for uh, compliance. It looks for, it does governance of your multi-cloud configuration with a good zero trust partner wrapped around the whole thing doing and, and threat hunting on the back end, right? So it's, it's a continuous, it's a continuous circle, always looking and vigilant. Um, oh, I, great. Thank you. Yep. Go ahead, Michaela. Yes. So, Maybe our audience is uh, questioning why we are focusing so much on automation. And this is not because um, OSCAL was developed by NIST. And I'm very grateful to our team and to uh, my colleague and um, um, a technical um, lead on the project, putting all this together. But one of the epiphany that I had when we entered the situation with 100% teleworking, but still having to operate those systems from the distance, is how are you going to reauthorize systems? How are you going without automation? How are you going to send eyes and hands where the systems, where the assets are to review that everything is in place if you don't have automation as much as possible? To, to alleviate some of those challenges. So probably that's one of the reasons why we put the automation uh, with us uh, as uh, you know focus of this panel, even though we have the zero trust, which is very important, and uh, and the DevSec uh, op, um, that were the topics that we want to highlight with our pilot. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. I think that helps to bring it all um, into context. Automation is, is key for that. Um, so with regard to kind of the, um, the zero trust uh, service and capability 
uh, concept. I'd like to ask Brian. Brian, you've seen a lot of <clears throat> evolutions in cyber technology and IT systems over time. Uh, your resume is quite long in this regard. And so is the zero trust concept, uh, the zero trust principles, and let, let's say the uh, uh, the concepts provided in the NIST uh, 800, Special Pub 800-207, right? Is this where we need to be going in industry and what might be your, your concerns as we do, since we are? <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I, think it, I think it's the right place to go because I, I think the days of being able to count on a bastion um, server on the outside, the perimeter, uh, to protect us entirely are over. I, I think we've seen that the number one vector for uh, malware coming into environments is essentially the user element via email. Uh, that's still the same today. Um, you know, phishing attacks, that's, that's a big problem. So phishing attacks, as we all know, blow right through the firewall and then they often get our um, users to be tricked into clicking on a URL that goes right back out through that same firewall uh, using, uh, you know, a port that we allow like 443 for a SSL or, or, or um, you know, a standard 80 uh, for HTTP, but no one almost ever uses that anymore. But um, so I think the key is, is to try and use automation and zero trust concepts to really focus in on the data and, and protect the data. And so I think, you know, Michaela made a good comment early on when she was talking about bringing the controls closer to the data. And I think that's the way to think about zero trust. I think many people are thinking about zero trust networking, but to be honest with you, uh, most of us are not gonna see the network stack, uh, you know, unless we're doing infrastructure as a service we're, if we're doing PaaS or we're doing uh, software as a service, that's invisible to us, right? That's that's essentially the realm of the cloud service provider. And I would in, uh, want to know that they're using zero trust at those layers of the network, of course. Um, but really zero trust has to be brought closer to the data and really be thinking of kind of a user centric and access centric model to the data. And how are we protecting that uh, in a way that it, prevents some of these attacks uh, from being able to be successful. Yes, Pretty good, much. thank you. Yeah, go, go ahead, Michaela. The zero trust architecture is to basically eliminate unauthorized access to the data. So with uh, our pilot, as we try to right. demonstrate a uh, way enforce device and user authentication uh, before um, any of the users um, in the devices get access to the environment that is protected by our open uh, SDP PAP. So um, the idea is that the firewall has absolutely no rules because the rules can go wrong. So rules can, uh, can be changed without um, authorizations. So the only way that the firewall gets open is when it receives that token that the entity, the process, uh, that requests access was authorized, was identified, authenticated, and authorized. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, I think it's uh, it's uh, appropriate to tell the world that we're we're going to get a new token, and it's the zero trust token. It's the SDP <laughs> software defined perimeter token, and um, I like to say that port knocking got its token in SDP. Um, so be on the lookout for that. It certainly is token based and it's a good idea. But let me bring let me bring zero trust to the endpoint, the cloud and automation together. And in particular what's in my mind is well first what Brian said, we need to get the zero trust access control closer to the data. Um, right now today we have a lot of zero trust cloud service providers, right? And they have their own clouds and you can use them. Um, but how do we bring zero trust access control closer to the data object um, in an automated orchestrated way um, as we deploy systems to the cloud? Who wants to take that one? 
Is that too hard? <laughs> well, <that's laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> I just really complicated yeah, that's a tough it. One, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, um, I, I, yeah. I think there's a lot of technologies. Right? So I think artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to be things to look for for the future for that, right? So uh, I, I think the ability to be able to recognize um, on a real-time basis if somebody is starting to go off the rails. So for example, I could have somebody who I've done all of the zero trust uh, checking on from the perspective of granting the user access to the data, but it turns out that that user is not that person or that person is the person, but they're now deciding to become a bad actor, right? You think of the IRS case where they had people that were going in and surfing uh, the ta tax returns of celebrities, right? Um, that, that are, those are the types of uh, behavioral analytics that, that have to be eventually brought to bear to look at, uh, am I the same person and am I acting in the same way and in a way that's within the security policy and risk tolerance of the systems that I'm operating within always. And, and, and so we're not there um, yet. There are some solutions in that space, but I think they're nation, they're kind of early on uh, and I think AIML will be something to watch for um, as we go forward. AIML, yeah. What what is that? Identity and access marketplace. Uh, uh, no, artificial intelligence. Oh, and, and, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Machine Oops. learning. Okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. Thank you for right. that. Um, so I was thinking a little right. <laughs> bit more along the lines of um, of um, one of uh, two of the tools that uh, NIST presented at Michaela's um, conference, ICAM conference, in I think it was January this year, um, they showed Istio, which um, um, produces a, a Kubernetes sidecar that runs in a container pod and serves security to all the workloads, um, and it it delivers in an orchestrated way. Um, and then they also introduced the concept of the next generation access control, which is why that's where I was going with AI. Um, but, um, and so they call that the NJAC, next generation access control. And I think it's David um, Oriolo, Michaela? Michaela? Yes, David Ferriol. Yep. Um, out it's of actually NIST. standardized, ISO standardized already. ISO standardized, yep. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if uh, anybody on the panel had experience with those two things, that, that Kubernetes sidecar and how it might be used in a DevSecOps environment, um, as well as, for example, the NJAC, Next Generation Access Control, which seeks to put PEPs, essentially, um, policy enforcement points as close to the data object as possible. Any, any experience that? Um, I can say. I can say from a checkpoint perspective, we do offer something like that. And I don't want to make it a commercial as, as you know we agree to, but there are workload pr protections and, and web uh, API and, and application firewall protections that work uh, in concert with a, an overall um, uh, posture management system that's always continually checking that. Because as we know, the, uh, the perimeter is now no longer that big ditch around the data center, right? It's around every one of these little microservice functions or Kubernetes um, pods that you talked about, uh, uh, these containers. Um, so security has to be res uh, enforced and reside there. So that, you know, we're seeing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, posture management. Uh, let me go back to Brian. Brian, you mentioned, uh, a standard called uh, Skip, was it? Skim, S-C-I-M. Can you talk a little I, bit more about that and how you might be, can you talk a little bit more about, about that and how you might be using it or considering it? And, I, and I'm thinking for posture sure. management. So, right? so you said it was an automation tool. Right, so, so Skim is really a protocol and kind of an open, API standard, I should say, right? And it's really used for primarily provisioning, uh, but it can also be used uh, from, if you have a provisioning system, we use one called SailPoint, but there's others out there. Um, 
if you can use that to provision to a cloud service that is SCIM compliant, then I have I begin to have standard APIs that I can use for being able to create user objects in those other and also entitlements in those other platforms. And likewise, if I'm doing a recertification of access, I can also query those platforms and they'll report back on user objects and their entitlements so that I can then check to see whether or not that matches what I expect to see both in my provisioning database and also for um, supervisors and others who are uh, recertifying access. So, um, you know, I, I think that uh, SCIM, SCIM um, is a uh, protocol that you want to look to see if, if your cloud providers are compliant with that and also if your provisioning systems are compliant with that because that will make this a lot more easy for you to automate. Um, I did want to mention one other thing on the data side. We, we do we don't use the tools that you had mentioned, but we do have agent-based tools that actually sit on database servers and watch certain uh, high-value tables that we're very interested in to see if we see um, things like select star or other types of queries that are looking for large results or anomalous behavior. So I think there's a de defense in depth perspective that we also have to put regardless of what our implementation um, details are, we have to build security controls in the different environments such that uh, we, ha <clears throat> we have a defense in depth strategy. Awesome. Um, I think we have really only three minutes. And um, if any of the um, uh, session hosts uh, can correct me, I think we have a few minutes. Uh, if we could just go around the room and take essentially one minute each of you to give the audience the takeaway that you'd like them to take as they leave this um, this session. Uh, Michaela, you first, and then Brian, and then Frank, and then we'll say goodbye. Sure. I think that for me, the most important thing is to uh, be cognizant of the fact that uh, you have to engineer cloud-based solutions that are always trustworthy, defensive, and resilient. Do not try, do not attempt to bake security solution after the fact when uh, when the system is already deployed or um, the system is in operational. That normally doesn't work. So take your time from the very beginning and uh, architect it properly. Uh, put on the table, on the board, everything that you want to achieve and then go through a thorough uh, assessment and authorization process. I would like to also, if I may, take just 10 seconds uh, to launch a call for actions when it comes to OSCAL. As I mentioned, we released the milestone three um, will be, the announcement will go out today, most likely. And uh, we would absolutely welcome not only collaboration with public out there, but more than anything, a feedback from you. We want to make it better. We want to make it useful to everyone. So please come work with us. Please tell us if what we are doing is good and if there's something that we are not doing well, please provide to us uh, your feedback, your perspective, and we'd like to work together on getting it better. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian? So what, what I would say is um, I, I think everyone should probably have arrived at the conclusion by now that the cloud is here and it, it is the future. It is here to stay. It's not some fad that's going to go away. So we really need to make sure that we embrace it, that we skill up. Um, so what I'm saying is every one of us has a responsibility to get trained up on this as much as we can. And I would say embrace these new open standards like OSCAL and skim and start to ask vendors, are you supporting this? Are you compliant with this? Do you uh, have this on your roadmap? Because we want them to start to use standard-based approach that we can use over and over again so that we become familiar with them as we need to automate our environments and reinstantiate security controls that we currently have in many cases on our prem and at our perimeter uh, out in the cloud environment so that we maintain a good security posture. 
So um, I, I also would say that the contractors that you have today are not the right contractors, right? If they don't have cloud expertise, I'm sorry to say it, but you don't want them to be learning on your dime. You need to bring in people that actually are experts in these platforms and not people that are trying to sit there with a, you know, cloud for dummies book, trying to figure it out. So we've brought in experts and uh, on each of the platforms that we brought in, and that has proven to be very successful where we, you know, did more of a sandbox or let's figure it out ourselves. It has not been as successful. And from a security perspective, you want people that can stand side by side with you and kind of bring your federal staff up to speed. Uh, and that's your that's getting contractors that have expertise in these cloud uh, technologies. Excellent. That's not to say that books for dummies aren't useful, right? <laughs> um, OK, that's, um, right. that's right. Very useful. <laughs> I've read a number of them. Um, Frank, go ahead. Takeaway, key takeaway. Yeah. Yeah, the, one of the things I wanted to drive home is that uh, security is really a, an overarching architecture that um, not only lives in the cloud, but your endpoint and your network and your mobile device and everything, because the perimeter is everywhere, you know, the cloud is everywhere. So you need to have an overarching architecture where all of those things feed into and interact with each other and work kind of interactively. Uh, I've said the word posture management 50 times today, so I'll keep saying that uh, in the, when it comes to the cloud, it, it's a way of automating and checking, uh, you know, your I am, your privileges, your uh, your posture for uh, how exposed you are to threats in the cloud. And it's important to work with, a, with you know, with a, a great company that does all that. So uh, thank you for having me on the uh, panel today and certainly stop by the Checkpoint booth and talk to me later. Um, okay, awesome. I'm going to wrap this up very, very quick. Thank you, everybody, for listening and joining and to our panelists for talking with us, uh, and you shared some great stuff. Let me put a plug in to please go check out the uh, sponsors of the event, Snowflake. Uh, I think they have booths going on right now. Frank's uh, company, Checkpoint, who uh, he's talked about. Uh, Smartsheet, uh, Plural Sites. Let me see if I get them all. Uh, and Palo Alto, I, I think that's the complete set. If I missed anybody, please forgive me. But again, thank you all for participating. And uh, we'll go ahead and turn the floor over to the next program. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Suter. I'm the founder of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. And I'm pleased to introduce my good friend and colleague, Frank Lancaster, Jr., who is the Director of Systems Integrators at Checkpoint, and that's his day job. His other job is he's actually on the board of directors at ATART. Welcome, Frank. Thanks, Tom. Uh, just as, a, uh, as an introduction, again, I'm Frank Lancaster from Checkpoint. I uh, work on the federal team with the integrators and really touch all of the federal accounts working on the programs with my uh, Checkpoint colleagues. Uh, today's topic is gonna be Who's responsible for your cloud security? And I know that's a bit, uh, you know, of an easy answer, but we'll, we'll explore it because I think there's some concepts in there that aren't quite always so obvious. So the agenda, we're going to talk about some public cloud considerations. Uh, assessing your risk and cloud security posture, it's very important. Uh, the shared responsibility model, we're going to talk about that a little bit. And again, that's going to be something that you're probably aware of, but we'll talk about it in some more detail and how you might partner with some folks to make sure your end of that equation is taken care of. Uh, and at the end, we'll talk about some actions and recommendations. But up front, I want to make sure you know this is going to be a high level architectural kind of talk without a really a, without a vendor specific focus. So no sales pitch, right? But first, let me tell you a little bit about Checkpoint and why we're here today talking to you. Checkpoint is a global leader with more than 100,000 customers around the globe. We've got close to 6,000 employees and have been working in this industry for over 25 years with the largest and some of the smallest too. We're not discriminating that way, <laughs> but we work with the public sector and in the private sector. So, you know, we've been around a long time and, and have a lot of expertise in this area. So cloud security, why should you care? Again, a rhetorical question. Of course you should care and the headlines bear it out. There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of things in the headlines of lately. If you see CDC, Dr. Fauci's on the news every night, right? For 
pandemic issues, but there've also been some public sector uh, groups in the headlines for not so good reasons. Uh, and the US Postal Service had a very large breach, uh, 60 million plus uh, user records were breached. Uh, OPM also 4 plus 4.2 million uh, user records were breached and uh, exposed to the um, to the public. You know, so what happens, you know, you can lose your job, you can lose your career, it's not a good thing, right? So that's why you care, right? You want to protect the public and protect your career. So who's responsible for cloud security? Um, you know, the answer is you are, right? The consumer. And Gartner says through 2020, 95% of security failures will be the customer's fault. And by that, many of these customers have the right tools. They're just not maybe configured properly. They're maybe not the updated with patches uh, or, or, or maybe just uh, the, the customer left a, a port open on a firewall, anyway, allowing the bad actor in. So what we really have a call for here is that as you're moving to cloud, which is what the presentation's about, moving all this to cloud, your, your attack vectors become exponentially large. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. So what we have here is your traditional data center and then the more complex cloud data center uh, or cloud center as a public and hybrid clouds that you'll be migrating from. Um, it's deployed on the left. You kind of had, you think about it like the castle with the big moat around it and you have these alligators and serpents in there that are keeping out all the bad actors, right? And they did a good job of it. You didn't hear many, many issues back in the data center days because that security perimeter was dug deep and it was really fortified. But now in the public cloud, where is that perimeter? Where does it exist? It's really at the app or the function. So, uh, and, and when I talk about functions, I'm talking about very short lived pieces of code that execute in a serverless world. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's really exponential, the amount of attack factor coverage that, that the bad actors have to hit. So it's real important that while you're doing that, you're in partnership with you know, trusted cybersecurity uh, consultants and people who know that area to help you. So we talked about uh, security in the cloud and shared responsibility. And, and, and the key here that'll resonate throughout the presentation is that short words matter. Security of the cloud is your cloud provider, right? He's or she, the, the cloud provider is responsible for the security in that cloud. Uh, security in the cloud, rather, is your consumer, your public sector organization. In the cloud is your data and applications. Of the cloud is your cloud provider. It's the HVAC, it's the networks, it's the databases and servers that you have racked up in there. So uh, make sure that you are working with you know, consultants and vendors while you are in the cloud because there are um, services that are provided that don't necessarily take care of all of that that you need. They're, they're worried about securing uh, the cloud fundamentals, but once you're in the cloud and your data and applications, it's up to yourself, right? You're, you're on your own there. The, the cloud provider's not helping you. So you're gonna need to, to work with uh, vendors and consultants to make that happen. Uh, I'll talk in the in the presentation a bit about shifting left and why it's better than right, but in the world of DevOps and DevSecOps, you hear about left shifting, and that's really what it's trying to do is bring the code testing, and we want to say the security testing farther to the left. There'll be more about that, but uh, uh, it, it'll be a theme throughout the presentation. Here's a quick picture. The picture says a thousand words, right? But this talks about the IaaS model. Of, uh, of public cloud, uh, where the vendor, the cloud vendor is just responsible for the bare bones, compute, storage, database, et cetera. And the customer, again, here's where you partner with someone to make sure that you have security east, west, and otherwise within all this data and application. There are lots of security cloud uh, challenges in the cloud. And again, I stress in because that's the piece about application and data control. You know, shared responsibility we covered, but uh, there's not a lot of visibility in the cloud when it comes to the native tools that you have. Uh, you need real-time protection and you need to make sure you're working with someone to make that happen. There's also insider threats, misconfigurations, a simple human error, and uh, credentials. You need to make sure that you're working on a least credential kind of way that, that your credentials are, are uh, when they're elevated, they're only temporarily so, and then they default back to the least amount. So you need IAM protection, compliance and regulation. 
you have lots of uh, uh, compliance standards that you have to have to adhere to, be they NIST, HIPAA, what, whatever they are. Uh, you need something that's working to make sure that you're in compliance so you don't get shut down. Outsider threats, malware, we're all aware of that, and zero-day threats. Zero-day threats are those malware that we really don't know about, right? They've been modified such that they can uh, skate, skate by the scanning that we're doing. You know, account takeovers and Gen 5 attacks. Checkpoints kind of uh, kind of coined the term Gen 5 attack. And what that really is, is nation states and organized crime syndicates, people with a lot of funding, are creating these advanced multi-vectored malware where they attack you on you know, several different surfaces at the same time in a coordinated effort. And they're really tough to defeat. So you need to make sure you have products in there that are taking care of that. Ultimately, we need to do security at the speed of DevOps. We've all read about how fast uh, apps are being developed. Uh, we talk about a cloud security blueprint, and that's a technical document. And stop by our booth. We're gonna have a, a virtual booth here at the summit. And we'll have some information about this, uh, a, 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 about all of these things, quite honestly. But you know, please stop by the checkpoint booth. But what the adaptive cloud uh, security operation talks about is that you need to be adaptive. You need to be um, in constant, uh, constantly scanning and, and working on uh, updating the codes and, and, and have access to a threat cloud of information that has the most up-to-date uh, amount of of CVEs that they can scan for, so we can keep your keep your cloud operations safe. There's also a concept in here of infrastructure as code. Back in the days of private cloud, uh, your your infrastructure was set up through ticketing systems, and uh, and then you would have an engineer uh, provision databases and virtual machines that would stay up for months at a time. And that's just not the world we work in right now. So we have lots of these things. Like uh, today, my iPhone got updated 12 times with app updates. So you can't have human touch on all of that. So automation and orchestration are key, and these templates need to be hardened. So, uh, so what we're really talking about here is making sure you're shifting your security to far to the left of this process as possible and hardening things and then automating them. Your data center and apps and function are now everywhere. So that, that this again is key. The traditional data centers are moving to hybrid and public clouds. Your centrally managed branch offices are going also to the cloud. And you'll see lots in the newspapers and then the federal trade rags about SD-WAN and TIC 3.0 because now the, uh, the data that's gonna leave your branch doesn't have to go back to the uh, to the corporate office and then go out some big security stack. It can go straight to the cloud and be inspected either locally or uh, in some firewall as a service uh, in the born in the cloud. These large monolithic apps and, and and applications that currently live in your data center are moving to these containers, serverless based microservices. Some of which only last very short periods of time, but yet still they're an attack vector. And your on-premise apps are, are moving to SaaS applications. So O365 is now the norm, as opposed to your old email that lived in your Exchange servers locally. Uh, slow release cycles to DevOps speed. So what I wanna do is drive home here is that uh, security needs to be driven far to the left in this, uh, as we go to deploying lots of cloud applications, CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline that we're seeing now, and the government's adopting this as well. Source code to the left, it needs to be scanned and looked, you know, in your infrastructure as a, as a code templates need to be scanned and hardened. And as they're built into deployment artifacts, which are the binaries and objects that are compiled, those also need to be scanned. And then as we deploy and stage and go live, we need to perform ad hoc scanning and posture and good posture and compliance management, all the while scanning all of your attack surfaces continuously. So I'll leave you with some DevSecOps and cloud best practices. One, the key is, and I won't go over all these, it's a, it is an eye chart, but make sure your development teams are trained and, and know to build security in early. 
You need to tr track security as if it was a software issue. A lot of these guys are very good at tracking software issues and uh, they need to make sure the security issues are equally important. If indeed infrastructure is a code, it also should follow that security is a code. So important to note. And again, I'll skip through some of these, but you wanna beat the code up early, make sure it's tested, it's hardened, and get these templates in good working order and then automate and orchestrate and take the human element out as much as possible. So I'll leave you here with this last slide. Uh, the perimeter is everywhere and so must be security. You know, the app, the function, the Lambda function, the Azure function, the Google function, all of these things that live in very short terms are where your attack vectors are. Where, the, where are the attack surface that these bad actors are, are going after? And if you think, oh, it only lives for a moment, it should be hard to hit. That's true, but these threat actors have found ways to do it and there's lots of them filled in the newspapers with, with them taking advantage of it. So the key is, and we talked about shared responsibility, all of this is the responsibility of the customer, the app security and the data security that lives in these public clouds. And what we need to enforce upon you and to, and to, and to compel upon you is that you need to really partner with good, solid, uh, you know, threat companies that know this area and that can bring to bear good threat remediation and, uh, and can scan these public cloud instances to make sure that you guys are safe out there. And speaking of safe out there, I want you all to be safe out there. Uh, this is my last slide. Certainly visit us at our booth. It's, I believe it'll, you know, we, we, Checkpoint's a sponsor. We'll have a, a virtual booth and a lot of our, our data will be there that I mentioned. And we'd love for you to reach out to us and ask us any questions. Thank you.